We at Pacific Church of Irvine invite you to join us every Sunday at 9.30. You can also visit our website at pacificchurch.com. You often hear secularists deride faith as the opposite of reason, but that is not how the Bible treats faith. When someone comes to faith in Christ, their faith should be built on historical record, biblical evidence, and the use of their reason. Instead of having a leap of faith, Jesus told us to count the costs of having faith. We'll also look at what faith is and isn't, and how Mary Magdalene came to faith in Christ. We've been doing a series in call, called Encountering Jesus. Some of my friends are around here in silhouette, uh, and, and uh, some of the people you now know by name, Nathaniel, the woman at the well, Nicodemus, uh, the man born blind. And what we've looked at in all of these different encounters is how did Jesus encounter each of these individuals Individuals who had a particular need. And what we've seen is he encounters each one of them differently according to what their need is and according to what he sees their need is. We've looked at some things like, what do I do when I'm skeptical? Is it enough to just to, to be religious? What, if, what does it look like when I'm a complete failure? Or when my relationship track record is terrible? Or... How does God meet us in, when we're in anguish or grief or covered with shame? Today we're going to look at Mary Magdalene. She is looking in an empty tomb. We're going to ask the question, what is faith? Uh, oftentimes in our culture you hear faith uh, from our secular culture. Take faith and juxtapose it against science. Well, either you believe in science or you believe in faith. Or sometimes they'll do that with reason. Either you believe in using your head, or you just take a leap of faith. Uh, this kind of argument, uh, or, or making a dichotomy like this, is really a cheap junior high trick of debate. People who do this call this a, the straw man argument. What you do is you have your argument, which is science or reason, and then you restate the other side of the argument in a way that sounds ridiculous, and then what you do is you ridicule the statement you just made about that that's as if that's the position. Faith is not antithetical to reason. Faith is based on reason. It's based on evidence. Uh, part of the reason we have the Bible, period, is so that we can look at the evidence to see how has God been at work in our world. And our faith is built on not just a leap of faith or a hope so kind of thing, but based on what God has revealed about himself down through the ages. Now, when it comes to this issue of faith, faith is not just believing a set of facts or mental assent to something, or I, I believe that's, that God exists. That's not the kind of faith that, that we're talking about. Faith looks at the evidence, and it draws conclusions, because faith... From the Bible's point of view, it's not just enough of what I believe, but I believe it enough to say no to me and what I want to do and yes to God and what he wants me to do. What we're going to look at today is I want you to sort of put on your detective hat. What we're going to look at is a scene. There are three eyewitnesses at that scene. What did each of these people observe? What did they see? What conclusions did they draw? How does this relate to faith? Uh, when I was, uh, before I became a Christian, about three months before I did, I started going to a church my junior year in college that taught the Bible. And one of my first impressions uh, about hearing the, the pastor, he was an old Scottish, little, little guy, Scottish brogue. But one of the things I remember about him teaching was, my first impression was, wow, there's really some good stuff in the Bible. That was my first kind of like, huh, wow. I was intrigued. It wasn't what I expected. I went back and I listened and I tried to learn. In retrospect, what I was doing was I was weighing evidence or the credibility of the Bible. I went in thinking that the Bible was written by a bunch of old men around an old table for old people in old ages. I came out about three months later thinking, the Bible is timeless truth, written for then and today. 
Now, that took about three months of weighing the evidence, using my head, trying to think this through. Now, there are five things that I want to say about faith today that come from our story from Magdalene, Mary Magdalene. The first is faith is not natural. If we're talking about a faith that says, oh, I believe a set of facts or, or I give mental assent or knowledge that God exists, uh, that might be natural. But the kind of biblical faith that Jesus calls us to is not natural because you can't get there without being willing to give up control of my life, my decisions, what I want to do, to put all of these things in his hand first. And nobody naturally wants to do that. In fact, that's one of the things that God has to overcome is our native natural resistance to surrendering ourselves or yielding ourselves as we sang just a few minutes ago. All right, let's look at our story. This comes from John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. First eyewitness on the scene. And saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Now, she had been walking with Jesus and the disciples, along with the group uh, right around them, for roughly three years. And on at least half a dozen occasions, she had heard him utter, this prediction. There's coming a day when I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be uh, handed into the, into the, betrayed into the authorities. I'm going to be condemned to death. I'm going to be mocked, flogged, crucified, and on the third day, rise from the dead. That's pretty specific stuff. Uh, for about half a dozen times, at least, that I can count, that happened. Now, if you were Mary and you went to the tomb on the, mor on the third morning and saw the stone was rolled away, wouldn't it be likely that she would think, oh, yeah, I remember him talking about this. I completely forgot. Arrested, that happened. Mocked, that happened. Flogged, we saw that. Crucified, we saw Risen on the third day. <gasps> wow. If that would you would you think that? Of course it must be true. Now, she's standing there, and what happens with her? Look at verse two. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples. She heads back to the house, the one Jesus loved. That's speaking of John, and said, "They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him." Resurrection is nowhere on her radar screen. In spite of the, the uh, stone being moved, in spite of the uh, seven particular uh, prophecies that's going to happen about this whole thing, and about resurrection and the timing of it, she is not there looking for that. Why? Well, probably for the same reason you and I would. Because resurrection, is that in the realm of impossible? Am I going to expect that that's going to happen or think that that might happen? Now, think about this. She goes back and tells Simon Peter and John, you have three of the most devoted followers Jesus has, Peter, John, and Mary, where the resurrection is nowhere on their radar screen, even though he had told them on at least half a dozen occasions that this is going to happen. In fact, what Mary does is he sort of sends them off on a wild goose chase. Somebody's stolen the body. We don't know where it is. So if they were at zero faith to start with, now they're at negative faith. It's kind of amazing to me. Now, you know, at different times I struggle with my faith, uh, like all of us do, struggle with our faith. When we do, for some reason, we think, I sh I've been the Christian all these years. I shouldn't struggle with this. Really? Faith is not natural. And even the three most devoted people at that moment, on a scale of 1 to 100, on the faith scale, were in the negative column. Faith is not natural. On the inside of your handout, the second thing I want us to look at is faith is based on historical record. One of the things I love about the Bible is you can go back and examine the evidence. Back through about 1,600 years of biblical history. Now, let's take a look at that prediction Jesus gave 
one of about half a dozen times that I count. Uh, this is a flashback moment uh, with the disciples. Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. He took the 12 disciples aside and said to them, We are going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Now, let's back up uh, one slide if we can. Okay, let's look at what, what was the specific prediction. Uh, verse 18, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be betrayed, that's item number one, to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, that's two, next verse, and turn him over to the Gentiles. So he talks about, he tells the guys, there's going to come a time that we get to Jerusalem, and the Jewish authorities are going to do three big specific things. Then he says, the Romans, the Gentiles, they're going to do three things. Uh, to be mocked, flogged, and crucified. Jewish authorities are going to do three things. Gentiles, Romans are going to do three things. They're up to six. And then he says, uh, on, the third day, uh, on the third day, raised to life. So let's add two more. It's going to be resurrected, and we have the time of the resurrection on the third day. Eight specific things. Now, I have trouble predicting what I'm going to have for lunch tomorrow, let alone what might happen a couple years from now, or about my demise. Every one of those things is outside of his control. It involves other people. Now, that's part of the historical record. It's one thing to predict something. You can look at the evidence and say, well, did those things come to be? That's part of what helps build faith. Uh, you think, well, man, if these guys didn't get it, what hope is there for me? The same hope for me. None. Look at this verse. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. We are saved by grace, God's mercy. Nothing that we do can save us. And even faith itself, it's almost like he comes up to us and virtually hands it to us. As we'll see in our story in just a few minutes. The gift of God, not by works so that no one could boast. Number three, faith is based on evidence. Again, sometimes our skeptics or our culture will talk about science as opposed to, to reason. Or a leap of faith. Just take a leap of, you just need to take a leap of faith, you'll hear uh, sometimes people say. Is that what the Bible said? When people came to Jesus, he said, no, 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 no. Leap of faith, that's crazy. You need to count the cost, was his phrase. Luke chapter 14, 26 to 33. You need to think this through. This is not just some easy belief thing. And, oh, isn't that cool? I'm going to go to heaven someday. No, 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 no. You're going to have to put me in front of every relationship you have is more important. Treasure me even in front of your wife, husband, father and mother, children, in, instead of more important than you and more important than the things you have. That's the only way we're going to understand and live the Christian life is if he is the center. Count the cost. That's the opposite of a leap of faith. Sometimes I've heard uh, people in our culture say, well, the disciples were, were just gullible. Just believed anything. And as we're going to see in our story today, the opposite was true. They didn't expect the resurrection to happen. Nobody in the Greco culture expected it. Nobody in the Roman culture expected it. No one in the Jewish culture expected it. And not even the disciples themselves expected it. Sometimes I've heard them say, well, they, the disciples just had to sort of have a wish fulfillment because they wanted the, 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 the movement to go on yeah, in spite of Jesus' death. Well, examine the evidence, as we'll do in a minute. As we look at Peter and John and Mary, are these folks that had a wish fulfillment? That they were going to believe in spite of the evidence just because they wanted to? If you're a skeptic about this, what I'd like to suggest is that you're going to identify a whole lot more with Peter, James, and Mary, Peter, John, and Mary, than you probably would like to admit. You will find them just as skeptical 
as you. Let's look at this story. It's morning three. Are the wish fulfillment guys at the scene ready for the resurrection? No. They're back in town sulking in a house because to them, the whole thing has come to a catastrophic failure and the one they loved is dead. Mary comes back to the house, tells, tells uh, Peter and the boys that uh, somebody's stolen the body. Verse 3. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. That's John. John gets to the tomb first. If Lance and I were running to the tomb that morning, I would have started out ahead, and he would have beat me there. <laughs> All right. Now, put your hat on. What does the evidence say? He bent over, this is John, and looked in, and, at, and he saw strips of linen here, the strips of linen being what they wrap dead bodies with, the corpse with, as they lay somebody in the tomb. Small tomb, just about big enough to be something about just like here. That, that, this is carved out of rock. They're not, you know, they're not building a two-story, you know, 2,000 square foot home here. Some little place to put a body. He looks over. There's no body. And he sees strips of linen that had been used to wrap his body. That's what he sees. Verse 6. Then Simon Peter, who was behind, that would be me, arriving. Peter goes in the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, corroborates the evidence that, that uh, John saw, as well as he sees something else that John missed, or at least John didn't record, as well as the burial cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Okay, you have evidence. We now have three eyewitnesses to this particular scene. Uh, what do we have? We have no body. We have an empty tomb. We have a stone rolled away. We have strips of linen that were used to wrap his body. And we have a folded up cloth that had been used to wrap his head. Okay, now put your Sherlock hat on. You have this evidence in front of you. All right, faith is based on reason. All right, what conclusions do you draw from the evidence? Okay, what are the possibilities? This is what detectives do. You have, this, you have these pieces of evidence. Um, did the Jewish authorities come and steal the body? That's one possibility. Um, if they did, would they unwrap the body with all of its linen protecting and make it a naked Jesus and take off the cloth around his head and fold it up neatly and leave it separate? Is that what they'd do? There were 16 Roman soldiers somewhere guarding the tomb. Uh, is this what the Jewish... Uh, authorities would do. Well, think about this for a moment. In the Jewish law, it was an anathema to touch anything that was dead or even associated with something that had been dead. That was unclean. Big, big deal. None of those guys is going to go in that tomb, let alone touch a dead body or the clothes. They're certainly not going to unwrap the body and have a naked body. And then the clincher here is... These guys, of all people, wanted to discredit Jesus. And all they had to do, once the movement gets going, all they had to do was, uh, hey, hey, guys, remember when, when Jesus said he was going to rise from the dead and the disciples are claiming he rose from the dead? Well, guess what we have? We've got a dead Jesus here. You know, I may not be a scientist, but he looks pretty dead to me. They didn't do that. Because they couldn't. Well, what about the Romans? Maybe the, the Romans' authorities came and stole the body. Would the soldiers have taken off the linen clothes, had a dead Jesus, taken off the cloth around the head, folded up neatly, separate, take it off? What reason would they have to do that, to steal the body? What reason would they have to, to leave the scene like this? 
There was coming a time when they were going to want to discredit the Christian movement as well. What about the disciples? Would the disciples have a reason to steal the body? Does it appear from our story so far that that's what they wanted to do or had any interest in doing? Not yet. Would they have come and, and undone the cloths, the linen strips and the cloth, and folded it up neatly? Not if you had 16 Roman soldiers somewhere lurking around. Not if the Jewish authorities were interested in keeping that body inside that cave. And from the evidence we've seen so far on the story, this is nowhere on their radar. Of course, the clincher about the disciples steal the body for me is all these guys would die for their faith one day. Peter would die on a cross. He's told the authorities, crucify me upside down because I'm not worthy to die like my Lord. Does that sound like somebody that would die for a lie? If they knew they had stolen the body, perpetrated a great hoax. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Are these guys who are eager to believe wish fulfillers? No, they are just as skeptical as any skeptic that you run into out there. Number four, faith is personal. Mary finally makes it back to the tomb. Peter and John have left. Mary stood out the t- outside the tomb crying. Now, how does she come to faith? What does it take for us to come to faith in Christ? What kind of evidence is put in front of her? Let's take a look at it. She bent over to look in the tomb. I already saw the, tomb rolled, uh, the stone rolled away. She saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been. No body, two angels. Now you're thinking, oh, that must have been it. Now I get it. Body's gone, and, and it took two angels sitting in front of me to finally wake up and smell the coffee. This is what he talked about, the resurrection. Uh, that didn't happen. Not yet. Uh, They asked her, woman, why are you crying? Now you've got angels talking. That must have done it. Now, okay, I've been slow to believe, but now, okay, stupid me, I get it now. Why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away. Still, resurrection is nowhere on her radar screen, and I don't know where they put him. She hears something behind her. She turns around. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. You're thinking, oh, that's it. She didn't get it with the empty tomb, didn't get it with the stone rolled away, didn't get it with the cloth or the, this cloth or the two angels or the angels speaking to her. Now, face to face, ah, oh, he's alive. Look on the back side of your handout. But she did not realize it was Jesus. If you think, man, my faith just seems so wimpy, you're in good company. Verse 15, Jesus says to her, woman, why are you crying? She not only sees him, he's talking to her. Why are you crying? Who is it you were looking for? And look what John says. Thinking he was the gardener. She said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. You have mounted up in front of this woman as much evidence as a skyscraper. And her faith is still at zero. Until the last piece. This is the best. Faith is personal. We aren't just joining a movement in general. We aren't just uh, one little grain of mayonnaise spread across God's bologna sandwich of life. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary. Mary, 
eyes open, heart opened. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Now, how does Jesus bring her to faith? There is a mountain of evidence that is presented to her in ever-increasing steps, built on a historical base where he predicts all of this to her on at least half a dozen questions. Uh, does he say, Mary, you just need to take a leap of faith. No matter what your emotions are telling you, no matter what your head is telling you, you just need to trust me. Is that what he's doing here? He's as, he's as far away from that as he can be. He is speaking to her tenderly, personally, gently. He cares about this gal. And finally, faith becomes hers. Not a generic faith, but it comes hers. His question, that, that uh, one of the questions he asks, he asks two, why are you crying? A rhetorical question. Who is it you are looking for? Another rhetorical question. Uh, but there is an answer. She's looking for, for the wrong Jesus. She's looking for a dead one. And as long as she looks for a dead one, she's going to be out of luck. Because he's nowhere to be found. Uh, but he's still tender all the way to the end where she comes to faith. Think about how he dealt with, with doubting Thomas. After the resurrection about uh, Peter, when they realize it's true, they come back and they tell all the guys, we've seen the Lord, it's true. Doubting Thomas, who'd been with Jesus for three years, says, I am not going to believe until I see the nail prints in his hand until I can put a finger in there and until I can put a hand in his side that was opened up with a sword. I am not going to believe. About a week later, the disciples are holed up in their little home. John records that the doors are locked and suddenly Jesus is in the room. He walks right over to Thomas and does he say, Thomas, you good for nothing, self-centered twit. You were with me for three years. Didn't you see who I was and what I've done? Oh, and by the way, I hung on a cross for six hours for you. Take a leap of faith. I would have said take a leap somewhere else, but I, <laughs> I'm not Jesus. You know what Jesus does? He comes up to Thomas and he says, see my hands. Take a finger, put it in there. Take your hand, put it here. Faith is personal. And it's almost as if he has to give it to these folks before it becomes theirs. Which is really the last point, faith is given. You might think, well, you know, I'm feeling a little bit stronger about my faith. I think that maybe I had a little bit more together than these three clowns. But we're really no different than Mary or Peter or John. She becomes a Christian, first Christian. Pretty amazing story. In that culture, a woman was next to nothing, sadly. She could not give evidence in court. She is the first one to give evidence of the resurrection. Jesus chose her. Uh, she was a moral outcast. She had a checkered past, we would say. Uh, she had been uh, tormented by demons. She had no moral successes of which to speak. And yet, she suddenly saved through faith, standing there at that moment. By grace you have been saved through faith, not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Faith became personal when he said, Mary. Have you heard your name? Craig. David. Mike. Jen. 
Ahora, Tamara. Annie Dillard, famous author, said that on the, at the moment she came to faith, she said, it's as if I had been a bell all my life until he lifted me up and for the first time I heard it ring. Let's pray together. Father, it's quite easy to be a skeptic and it's quite easy to be a skeptic and have a hardened opinion about being a skeptic without looking at the evidence. And that's just intellectually dishonest. Uh, of course, we shouldn't think that that would be out of the ordinary because nobody really wants to come to faith. None of us do. Not if it involves a surrender and, of our control to you, of our life. And yet here in this story, you overcame every resistance, every blindness, every obtuseness, every bit of pride, gently, tenderly, bringing her to faith. You've done the same thing for a lot of people in this room. And maybe there are some of you who are, have been a skeptic and wondered. You have a chance today to look at some of the greatest evidence there's ever been. And draw your own conclusions. As you do, I hope you'll listen for your name. Thank you for joining us as we continue the series, Encounters with Christ. Pacific Church of Irvine meets at 9.30 a.m. every Sunday, and we invite you to join us. You can also visit our website at pacificchurch.com.